Great game in the morning! Hello everybody, this is Jonathan Albin, the Game Master, and we are here at the Game Master Soapbox to talk about something that is uh, not commonly discussed, and yet it uh, might play a major, uh, major influence on the way you play your roleplay games. Let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Today's topic is in particular... Game session setups. And when I speak of game session setups, what I'm referring to is the way or the dynamic between the game master and the players. And nobody really talks about this because every role play game generally thinks that it's uh, unique or that it's different from what other people have done in the past. Or they think they're doing just what exactly the book says to do, in which case they're, they're, they may or may not be correct. So what we're going to talk about are some different ways to do them. Now I'm going to start off with one that's that's pretty scary only because it was the first one that popped into my head when I was thinking about this. But these are all ways that I've seen role play games play over the years and to greater or lesser extent I've appropriated pieces of each one for the game sessions that I run and I found that the game style sometimes is a perfect match for a game system. In other cases, sometimes it's less effective or less useful or less powerful. So as we go through them, I think you'll see some of the benefits and uh, uh, faults of them as we go along. So we're going to start off right at the top with the scary one. We're going to talk about hidden action. Now, this is something that is historically a powerful tool and goes back to uh, the game Diplomacy. And if you have never played Diplomacy... It's one of the earliest, I guess you'd call it a role-play game, but it was set up initially with a board structure and was actually a dynamic conversational uh, war game. And it is played over several seasons, and you are playing through the time period and the conditions that were in place at the beginning of World War I. And it's a it's a lot of fun, but it's also nerve wracking and can uh, lead to some really hostile interactions between the players afterwards because the actions of the game require you to do things that in our in well in any culture are considered to be a uh, uh, dirty pool or, or or bad form. It's a game of uh promises and deceit you guarantee you're going to do thus and such and then either you do or you don't and when you aren't able to fulfill the things that you promise then you create a a negative with the other person so although it does call to mind the actual emotions that must have gone into the the concepts of people who were actually running governments at the time it is rather strident and the idea here is that in a role-play game, you could actually play using a hidden action. And I have seen it done, and I have done it myself from time to time, and it does definitely change things. Generally, the way it would work mechanically is that the uh, game master would tell the players the conditions of a situation, and then each player would write down their action in a few words on a, a strip of paper and turn that in. And then the game master would resolve them in order to determine which one happens first and such like. And then he resolves it mechanically and then he expresses the res resolution to each player individually or collectively if they decided to work on something together or at the same time. So there would be times when everyone would be involved and everyone would see what was going on, everything is fine, and then the following turn, those three players over there on the left go, and they're doing what they're going to do, and those three players over on the right go and do what they're going to do, and uh, between them, they create some dissension and such. It makes for a really exciting game. There's a lot of drama and thrills while you're waiting to see what might happen, given what you've chosen and as an action and what others may have chosen. But it's dangerous, because players tend to get invested more when their decisions are being measured by a comparison with other people's decisions. And so just be aware that it's really powerful 
It's really effective in especially a professional group of guys that, you know, that every, everybody at the table, uh, gals, guys and gals, whatever, with that are playing, are all intensely aware of the mechanics of the game and are understanding that it's just for the, the essence of the event. But it is, it is stressful. And it's not for everybody, and it doesn't work in every game environment. So just wanted to get that one out of the way. So now we go to the second one, and the second is probably one of the oldest. I remember when there were very few of us Game Masters who actually had sets of dice. And so since the Game Master had all the dice, players would defer to the Game Master to roll. Now he would roll in the open so people could see the die rolls. But he would then interpret that die roll success or failure, and therefore the players would learn like armor class of a monster or whatever, only specifically if they got the... Uh, the uh, rare opportunity to actually successfully hit the monster and therefore they were able to extrapolate and defer values and, and therefore transfer the information. Game Master rolling is good for dealing with things like your player's stealth functions or their uh, bluff checks or whatever. When the, when the dice rolls can be done secured where the Game Master is the only one that has eyes on it, these are, these are uh, opportunistic and provide a really good game experience in some ways. But in other ways, it's restrictive. Players don't feel the agency involved. And if the Game Master's story form is too narrative, it feels like he's just making stuff up. So Game Master-only rolls can work, and especially with a brand new group, it's sometimes best to have the Game Master roll the dice until the players get a feel for what they should be rolling. And then you let you trade it off, but just realize that it's a useful tool for a short period of time, but it's not something that you want to continue to do long term necessarily. Uh, next are rolling the initiative ahead of action, and this is particularly good if you're wanting to cause the players to have to snap decide. You want to test their capability of of decision deciding on the moment because they're not given the opportunity to think about what they're going to do. They have to look at, they can think all the way, they can consider all the way up until their number comes up on the die roll. So therefore, the initiative ahead of action means that they don't even get to say what they're going to do until it is their turn. Now this does avoid one problem, and that is the idea of players saying they're doing multiple things at the same time, and then one person wins on the initiative. They get to accomplish it, and the other person doesn't. So there is a benefit to an initiative ahead of action kind of system because your players have to think more on their feet about what's going on. But generally this only applies if it's an all out combat situation. If there's any players who might be doing something on the side or, or surreptitiously, it, it kind of defeats the purpose because they're at, they have to wait until their action to make their no decision known. Next are player determined results. And this one, from a game master standpoint, it's actually one of the more nerve wrackings because uh, when the player rolls the dice, you're having to be sure they know what the armor class is, and so then they are narratively telling you what the how the combat went from their side of the coin as far as whether they smote the creature heavily in the chest or they went for the head or whatever, and using a player determined results does tend to make the players feel their agency a little bit more strongly. They feel more connected because they are the ones who are building it. But at the same time, you have a lot of players who don't like to have to come up with that. They're there for the entertainment of the story, and they want the explanations to come out from merely a numbers interpretation on the part of the storyteller. So game, a player-determined results can be problematic in their own right, but they do give the players more active agency. Next are the open field collective play. And I call it this because this is where the game master himself is actually participating as a player in the story. I've seen this done a lot to less than successful effect because the player is doing so sort of as his own wish fulfillment that he's actually building the opportunities for his own greatness. And that's, that's problematic. But on the other hand, I've seen it be very effective for new groups. A game master who is a veteran with a, with a table full of new players, it gives them an opportunity to see what, what things might be possible. 
And so for short term, I can see somebody doing an open field collective play just to get others used to what's going on. Once they do, then you would wean your character out of the story and then let it go back to a normal event. The next is almost what you'd call the standard role play game, and that is call and response. Game Master calls out the action, turns to each player in turn based on when they have their initiative and their decision, what it is they're going to do next. And it's call, response, call, response. And it's it's okay. It it becomes mundane. It becomes routine. And sometimes that's boring. Sometimes it's less than effective because you have to have already discovered whether or not you made the, the perception roll before you can respond. And so a little bit of the mystery is gone. A little bit of the surprise. It is efficient. Definitely efficient. But it does lead to the concept of bam bam you know i rolled a hit oh I'm, i didn't do enough damage you rolled a hit no you didn't kill me i rolled a hit and that kind of thing happens from call and response but generally it does allow for more uh variability in the actions that the players want to choose on now i'm going to mention two more and these two are are very different from each other and are both are pretty much fallen from grace the first one is that the, the group would actually the players would actually choose a group leader and that group leader would t t take be in charge of the initiative, charge of the calling out the group's actions for verifying the stats that are going to be used and all of that in advance. And then he acts as a mediator and tells the game master the conditions and situations. The game master makes the die rolls, the resolution, disseminates that back to the leader, and the leader then conveys out the information to the players. This old system this is very ancient this goes back to first uh, iteration first edition way back the concept of a group leader was helpful because it stopped a lot of the uh cross play where a person speaking in the meta not actually in the game a person who is not in the scene interfering and interrupting this kind of things were taken care of by having a group leader in the process but it did did cut down on the uh, agency and more importantly it cut down on the individuality of the role play game now for the benefit of many players who don't like the limelight and don't prefer those moments when they're called in front of the player other players to respond the group leader concept gives that uh, agency possibly to somebody who's actually volunteered for it and usually it would be somebody who was either uh, had a role as a bard or a paladin or a, a cleric, someone who's supposed to be able to speak in groups anyway. And so it was kind of like practice for that class. So this concept of group leader spokesman, although it's antique, I would suggest you give it a try at some point because it, it, it does change the dynamics of the game. Now, the final is the most rare, and this is some group custom process. And I've seen a lot of investigation a lot of players try different things so for example the game master describes the situation then he tosses the ball off to the first player who talks about what he's doing narratively and what he sees is going on with the others in addition to what the game master said so maybe i maybe the game master has said there's a a group of orcs moving forward and as the first player's action steps into the room he's going to call out oh there's one of the orcs going for the left somebody grab him and so therefore they're adding to the story as they go embellishing it amplifying it and then each player gets to add their part it it can be fun it can be nerve-wracking as h to remember whose turn it is and what's going on and where we are in the time frame but it does lead to some great clever confusion so the idea of customizing your game sessions is is cool the one thing i would would recommend is that if you haven't tried some of these other recommendations Give them a shot in your game group. May I recommend maybe a shakeup and suggest using initiative ahead of action, or maybe have a game master roll all your dice for a night. That kind of thing. These are these are just some options. But the main thing is to realize that role play games, no matter what their flavor, their genre, their setting, they're all mechanical tools. the the the, the game portion of it is a tool to convey information back and forth and to produce entertainment for the players in the group so all of these are ways you may want to consider to liven up your group change things up a bit and maybe create a more dynamic 
games group. Who knows? You may come up with one that I don't have on the list. Matter of fact, you may have a group already that's doing something that's not in keeping with any of the ones that I've mentioned. Please feel free to leave in the comments and, and in the chat anything you'd like to re uh, refer to in those cases. This is a merely a spectrum of what might be possible, but you may have read into something different. I would love to hear about it. I want to thank you. This has been Jonathan Albin and the Game Master's Soapbox, and this has been the Game Session Setups episode. And so if you have any additional comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section on the YouTube page, which is at Nikos RPG, or here in uh, Twitch. You can either leave it via chat or you can leave it in the comment section as well. Love to hear from any 